front on the small and woolly bag. At the moment, we are spending more money than we make, which is why we're putting out all these posters and asking for donations of people who would like to join. So, encouraging people to subscribe to those options. There's also a raffle, which was a um, so, can I move on from that to remind everybody to turn the phones off? Uh, toilets are uh, down the back there, and there are some free gears. The order of the events this evening is that uh, I'll talk to a few words about Terry Fielding, and I'm going to do a search of his name, and then at some time we'll speak, and then he gets to know to ask questions. And at the end of that, there is some more food and some more drinks that people will clean around afterwards to do that and uh, have a chat about what we're talking about this evening. So,
for the Australian Human Rights Commission, where he worked on AI and technology, refugees, migration, human rights issues affecting LGBTQI plus people, and a whole bunch of other things. He was previously the executive, executive of the Public Interest Advocacy Centre, senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales Law School, and before that, like some of us, a humble solicitor in my practice. Uh, there's hope for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I'm going to be here. You've got to be here. Thanks very much for that warm introduction. It's great to be here um, and to hear a little bit about uh, Derek Wilding. Um, sorry, Derek Field, sorry, uh, in whom um, this, this lecture has been named. Um, I'm hoping that in a moment uh, the projector will work. I'll just unplug it and plug it back in again, see if that helps. Um, see if Craig can help with that. So, artificial intelligence and human rights sounds like a strange uh, kind of intersection to be interested in. Um, and, and to be really, really clear, um, I'm interested in how AI can advance human rights, but I'm perhaps more interested in the dark side of AI, how AI can have really negative effects on our human rights. And I'm going to be leaning in a bit more to that, that dark side. Um, but in order to, to get there, uh, I was asked actually earlier today, what's my origin story when it comes to human rights and AI? Uh, particularly because, yeah, I'm a humble lawyer, as you say. Um, humble human rights lawyer. I, I'm, I'm interested much more in the humans than in the robots. Um, so my, my origin story is this. A couple of jobs ago, before I was human rights commissioner, um, I was, as, as Michael mentioned, the um, the, the head of an organisation called the Public Interest Advocacy Centre, a human rights organisation in Sydney, um, which, among other things, provides free legal advice representation um, to young people who come into contact with the police. And what we saw um, was this strange situation um, that started to repeat itself over and over again, and we couldn't understand what was going on um, for a number of years, um, or what was, what was at the root of what was what this problem. The scenario was essentially this. We have a young person that come to us with a very, very similar story um, over and over again. They would say, look, I was doing something my own, riding on the train without a ticket. And then for months afterwards, five, six times a week, the police would come and check on me. Um, and by check on me could mean they would over and over again check on me between midnight and 6 a.m. at my home or at school, or at TAFE, or uh, during my apprenticeship, all of those sorts of things. And I can't work out why I hate it. This is harassment. I hate it. We, we, we started digging, and there were a few things that, that, that came to our attention. Again, we couldn't quite immediately work out what was going on. One was that all of our clients had dark skin. Now, I don't mean some of our clients. I don't mean most of our clients. Every single one of them had dark skin which was interesting and strange. And then we, 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 we started hearing about this list, and the list was called the Suspect Target Management Plan. The police would sometimes say, they were being asked, why are you constantly harassing me? They might eventually say, well, you're on this list of Suspect Target Management Plan. We did a lot of digging. Eventually, what came out under questioning in Parliament was that there was an AI algorithm that was being used to identify kids who were at risk of going on to a life of crime, as the saying goes. And the algorithm was trawling through the criminal justice data set um, going back decades. And it learnt wrongly, but perhaps understandably, that Aboriginal people were more likely to commit crime. Now, as I say, that is factually incorrect. But of course, we also know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people overrepresented historically and even today in our criminal justice system. So what the algorithm did was it started identifying Aboriginal kids in the, in the system. And so um, just to give you one statistic, of the 1,800 young people on this list, 55% of them were Aboriginal, 55%. When you think the Indigenous population in New South Wales is less than 3%. 
So this was AI going wrong at scale. This was more than a decade ago. Um, and it made me really interested. I was thinking, well, this is this incredible new technology that is sort of left out of the laboratory into the real world. We're told to be really excited about it, and there are lots of things to be excited about, but there's this incredibly dark side to it. So that's, that's what got me interested in it. I'm going to do a few things this evening. Uh, in the boring bits, think about some difficult questions you can throw my way. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do is talk a little bit about what, what we mean when we talk about AI. Um, and then I'm going to give some examples of how it can go wrong and, and, and what we're going to be doing about it, what we are doing about it. So this term AI is not a term of art. It's not a scientific term. It's a term, it's a marketing term, really, a bit like modern medicine. It's meant to connote something very impressive. Um, so we have to be a bit more precise when we hear this term AI, what do we really mean? What we generally mean is the convergence of four key technologies and techniques. The first is big data. Uh, but by big data, we just literally mean what it sounds like, large amounts of information. Now, we've often had large amounts of information, but working at human speed, it's been like trying to find needles in haystacks. So we haven't been able to make the most of large sources of information. The second thing is machine learning. If there's anything a little bit magic about AI, it's machine learning. Machine learning simply means, however, finding patterns in information in, in big data sets. I'm going to come back and expand a little bit on what I mean by that. But just, just believe me for the moment that machine learning is really at the center of this. Then you have automation. So if you had you know, machine learning operating very, very slowly at human speed, that wouldn't work very well. But if you can automate it, then you start to be able to do something. But then the, the final missing piece was these massive increases in computing power that we've seen year upon year upon year. Some of you will have heard of Moore's Law, which has been operating for decades now, where basically the tech industry is able to produce a doubling in computing power regularly at 12 to 18 month intervals. And they've been now doing it for decades, which means now that the smartphones, which I can see some of you are holding and got in front of you, I've got one in my pocket. A typical smartphone is a million times more powerful than the computer that took the Apollo uh, space shuttles to the moon. Um, and that's democratized computing power that we all have access to. It's quite, quite extraordinary. A million. a million times more powerful, yeah. So I mentioned uh, machine learning is the thing that's a little bit magic about AI. Um, so I want to explain how it works. You start with training data. So I'm giving you a pineapple based example of AI. So if what you want to do is get your AI to be able to generate pictures of pineapples, discern from a whole bunch of pictures, what's a pineapple, what's an apple, tell you about pineapples, whatever you want about pineapples, you have to start by giving it training data. So, and that training data needs, needs some labels, right? So if it's, these are apples, these are pineapples, as much training data as you possibly can. And then the, what the algorithm does is that it looks for patterns and it starts to learn, right? That the apple has a distinctive shape and a set of colors, pineapples, spiky, different shape, um, different characteristics, it will learn those patterns, right? It, that's the automated bit. It'll find those little characteristics in um, the data set. And then you can ask it a question. What is this thing? And it's never seen that specific picture of a pineapple before, but it will look for those patterns and it will be able to tell you this is indeed a pineapple, right? That is simply how it works. And that is a very simple example, but that also describes the most sophisticated forms of AI that we have these days, things like um, ChatGPT, generative AI for that sort of thing. Um, that's all the technology um, is, it, it relies on that, that basic system. So um, how is this being deployed in the world today? Um, and I'm gonna start with the positive. So uh, if you were to ask a question, how should lawyers use AI safely? I'm sure most, probably all of you have played around with ChatGPT and some of the other generative AI applications. It'll just spit out some really interesting information, or some somewhat interesting information. Sorry? Uh, an app that I'm playing with right now is yep. called Court AI. Right, yeah, yeah. And that one, I'm um, here to make an opinion on it. Yep. Um, it comes up with data sets of court cases. Yep. However, you have to know how to go and ask it the right question yeah. to pull up data sets. It'll be coming up with machine learning if you need to get a professional data. Yeah. 
Yeah, there you go. Exactly. So it is kind of amazing, right, um, that it's able to do this. And, and we, we talk a lot about how it's being used to generate new text, like, like the example on the screen. Um, but it's not just text. For a deeply, deeply uncreative person like me, they have to do the amazing things. So the, the little video that's going on behind me, you've got a base image. And then uh, what the human is doing is typing in things that um, they want to see in the image. So putting a little splodge there for a tree, um, and they want to see a tree. Another splodge there for uh, a couple walking down the street, and so it is. Another splodge there for the moon, and so on. I mean, that, that is truly, truly amazing, right? It, I, I readily acknowledge how extraordinary that is. I know that you know there's a but coming, and there absolutely is. Here is where we get into the but. So the first problem is that it can be used nefariously. It can be used deliberately to um, trick people. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of um, deep fakes. There's a couple of examples um, there uh, of two of our kind of more prominent female politicians um, who uh, you know, the, the, these videos that were created, I couldn't, I honestly couldn't tell the difference between the real Penny Wong or um, Katie Gallagher and the um, and the fake versions as, as, as we're here, but they were saying things that they would never say. Um, there, uh, there, there was an example of Services Australia, which obviously administers our um, federal social security system, where they decided to use an AI powered um, voice print technology, which essentially identifies you by your voice. Um, and that was hacked effectively. Um, and therefore, people were able to get into other people's Centrelink and Social Security, um, MyGov um, uh, system, um, which was terrible. Um, as someone who serves on the advisory board of Services Australia, it was just terrible. Um, and then there, there, there are lots of examples of this sort of thing. So this was an example from uh, Twitter um, about 18 months ago. Uh, it was just a kid in a basement. Um, and what he did was he created a fake Bloomberg Twitter feed, um, which he called Bloomberg Feed. And then using um, that Adobe product that I was showing you before, the image generation product, he said, he basically typed in, I want a picture of the Pentagon, the home of the US military in flames, with lots of smoke billowing out. And that was the image that was created. He put it on his Twitter feed and lo and behold, it went viral because people thought it was the real Bloomberg News Service. And, and this was a very, very um, convincing image of, of the Pentagon in flames. Now that had real world impact. Um, within uh, moments, billions, with a B, billions of dollars were wiped off the US stock exchange. Um, and this is technology, as I said before, that has been democratized. It is available in the hands of anyone. It doesn't really matter um, what money you have access to and doesn't you, you no longer need specialized expertise either to operate some of these tools. So, so, so that is one set of problems that, that worry me. Um, but another set of problems is the exact opposite of what I've just described. I sometimes say that we're living in the kind of Wright Brothers age of aviation when it comes to AI. So if you were a contemporary of the Wright Brothers and you saw them take off um, in the United States, you know, more than 100 years ago, you would have been really, really impressed because you didn't know what was coming. You didn't know that we would have jumbo jets and Airbus and all that sort of thing coming um, many years down the track. So it was incredibly impressive by its own standards, right? But it's not in relative terms. And, and I would say the same thing about AI. AI is still prone to the most egregious mistakes. That origin story that I told you about before, um, that the term um, at the heart of that problem is algorithmic bias, where the, basically the machine learning system goes off on the wrong track and learns, understandably, incorrectly, um, that some group of people needs to be targeted for some harmful activity. Um, that's a common problem. Um, so uh, there are lots of examples that bear this out. Um, I quite like this one. 
some of you may have come across before. It's, it's known as the muffin uh, and chihuahua problem. So literally tens of millions of dollars have been spent by some of the biggest tech companies in the world trying to solve the muffin chihuahua problem. Has anyone come across the muffin chihuahua problem? Anyone know what I'm talking about? Okay, so this is a mistake that I'm really confident none of you has ever made, right? It would be tragic um, to mistake a beautiful chihuahua for a blueberry muffin. I feel like an idiot explaining why you will never make this mistake, but I will explain it anyway. You don't make this mistake because you understand context. You have common sense, as we call it, right? You understand that if the thing is barking at you, and it's sitting on the floor and it's running around, it's much more likely to be a chihuahua than a blueberry muffin, even though we can acknowledge that there is superficial similarity between the face of a chihuahua and the top of a blueberry muffin. <laughs> but we understand those things, right? Whereas some of the most powerful AI applications, image recognition in this case, applications, don't have common sense. They don't understand the world the way we do. They work on machine learning. They work on finding patterns in the data and the patterns they're looking for are very superficial, right? So this thing that we would never make a mistake on, uh, machines are much, AI-powered machines are much, 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 much more likely to make that mistake. And that's not an easily solved problem, right? There is no question that image recognition is improving um, and it's improving significantly, but it will continue to make these mistakes um, whatever we are building these systems based on machine learning. Um, if that makes sense. Um, now, some of this stuff, I, I, I feel like to, today I've given um, some pretty black and white examples, but there's a lot of grey. Um, so in the book that I've just published that came out last week, um, my co-author Daniel Neller and I talk about this particular example that I find very troubling and not simple to resolve. It goes back to the start of the Ukraine war and it's still happening now. Like in most conflicts, or well, many conflicts I should say, um, what was happening right from the early days of the Ukraine war was that Russian soldiers were dressing up as Ukrainian civilians, they were pretending um, that they were Ukrainian civilians, sneaking into Ukraine and causing havoc. I mean, in flagrant violation of international law. But imagine the situation, you're an 18 year old Ukrainian soldier and someone's brought to you and they're dressed as a Ukrainian civilian, but there's a good chance they're not, that they're, they're a Russian soldier um, who has been infiltrating the country um, in, in violation of the law. So you're an 18 year old, you've got to make that call. Incredibly difficult decision to make, right? Like, wh what do you do? You, you, you strain to try and get the differences in accent. You ask them questions about place uh, and, and context that you, you would expect them to understand. But it's, it is a very, very inexact science. So into that fog of war came a really controversial company. It's the biggest facial recognition company in the world happened to be started by an Australian. It's also the most controversial facial recognition company in the world for good reason. And what they said was, we can, we, we, in fact, we have created an application that you can put on your smartphone that that 18 year old Ukrainian soldier can use, hold up the smartphone, take a selfie, and it will say Russian or not Russian. How does it do it? It works on machine learning. And, and, and again, um, it draws an inference. So the inference it draws um, I'm just simplifying a little bit just to, to get to the nub of it, is that if that image, if that person was on a Russian social media page, then it will infer that the person is Russian. And most of the time that will be true, right? That, there's no question that most people on Russian social media pages are Russian, right? But not everyone. There'd be lots of reasons why a Ukrainian person might have visited, might have uh, Russia, might have Russian family, might be there's any number of reasons why you could be there, right? I recognize that that 18 year old soldier has a very, very difficult task. Now, you give that 18 year old soldier a smartphone with the application and you give them certitude, which is very different from certainty, right? You give them this 
there's a there's a three dollar term for this as well, which is algorithmic deference. That 18 year old is petrified of making a mistake, but you tell him or her that you will have a technologically accurate answer and you will get it instantaneously from your very clever smartphone. And what you actually do is you change something very subtle but very profound. What you do is instead of that young soldier being quite cautious and worried about their decision about whether the person is rational or not, you give them the certitude that you can just defer to the machine. And that is deeply, deeply worrisome to me, particularly in high stakes decisions and it probably goes without saying to, to, to say there are a few more high stakes decisions than this sort of decision because of course, if you make a mistake and wrongly decide that the person is Russian, that person could be detained, could be killed, right? Um, but if you wrongly decide that they're Ukrainian, that person could go and cause havoc, could kill a number of Ukrainian citizens, could kill even your family if you're that 18 year old Ukrainian soldier. Um, which brings me to uh, my next point, which is about our relationship with AI. So I introduced just a moment ago that, that idea of algorithmic deference. That, that, that sense that we sort of defer to the machine more than is rationally sensible. Um, has anyone come across the Google engineer Blake Lemoyne? Does anyone know Blake Lemoyne's story? Yeah? yeah. He's a man who made a claim on the internet that the, the AI that Google has um, got um, a sentence. That's so right. It's a certain term that it's a lie. It's yeah. Like a man from Hollywood that it's a lie. You, you, and he made claims about it and uh, Google has I believe this is missing, so that's right. Um, and his story has gone viral and stuff. Yeah, that's 100% right. So, so Blake Lemoyne was a PhD level um, you know, data scientist. He was an engineer. He'd been working for a number of years on Lambda, which was the kind of um, most sophisticated of uh, um, Google's AI powered chatbots, these, these generative AI chatbots um, and he engaged in these conversations over months and months and months with Lambda and eventually he became convinced that um, Lambda had feelings that were sentient that it had basically almost you know become alive or at least it had developed some kind of soul. The particular um, string of text that Lambda produced that caused uh, Dr. Lemoyne to um, reached that view was um, was a really simple string of text. Um, it, 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 the, the string of text was, I sometimes have a deep fear of being turned off. Um, and it played on his heartstrings. Now, let me be really clear. Lambda was not sentient. It's not sentient now, and it wasn't sentient then. Um, what this was is something that many of us will have experienced have you ever been to a farm, right? And you see in a far off field uh, a scarecrow. And you know, the left hand side of your brain knows it's just a jumble of straw and old clothes. But you look at it and you go, it just moved its leg. And then you kind of shield your eyes from the sun and you look at it more closely and you say, crack it, just moved its other bloody leg too, right? It's, it's a trick of the brain, not of the eye, of the brain, right? But the more and more we train these machines on us, I mean, and that's literally what we are doing. We're training them on us, on, on, on our data, on the decisions we've made, on our art, on our words, on all of those things. The more they will produce outputs that are like us. Um, the thing that was particularly I guess noteworthy about uh, Blake Lemoyne's situation was that he was the guy that filled the scarecrow with straw. You know, he was the guy that had done a lot of the programming that had trained the machine to sound human. And then he was, it was like he saw the scarecrow and said, oh, bloody hell, it's become alive, you know, <laughs> and forgotten that, that, that it was straw all the way down. Um, and I guess, that's a quite a profound challenge for our human rights. 
that we are building these machines in our image. Um, I just launched my first book last week, which was, that was the title, machine, Machines in Our Image. We we're building these machines in our image, they're trained on us, they are trained to operate and sound and be like us, but it, they have therefore all of our human frailties and they are in an anthropological sense preying on our human weaknesses. Um, not deliberately, that's how they're programmed, right? So I'm not saying that these, these machines are sentient. They are not. They are absolutely not. I am in no doubt about that. But I recognise that they sometimes sound like they, they are. So my last sort of uh, section here is what are we going to do about it, right? So this is a big part of my work and has been over the last five or six years is how do we make sure that um, our laws and the way in which our laws are enforced will keep our human rights protected. Um, so there's an interesting kind of narrative that has developed over the last decade or so, and it's, it keeps on changing um, out of Silicon Valley. So you may, may remember a decade ago, um, the, the dominant view out of Silicon Valley when it came to law was best summed up by um, Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, now Meta. He said, move fast and break things. Essentially, he was saying all regulation is bad. Um, if there was a single moment that made clear that that was an untenable position to hold, it was the Cambridge Analytica scandal in the late 2010s. So then we moved on to a different uh, tack, or they moved on, Silicon Valley moved on to a different tack. And that, that, that was this thing about the ethics of AI. We need to understand, we need to really deeply consider the ethics of AI. And that was a useful debate, briefly, um, because what it did was it, it, it acknowledged for the first time that AI wasn't inherently good. It was neither good nor bad, it was, but nor was it neutral. It could cause harm, right? It could cause harm, just as had been acknowledged back in the 1960s. Um, and that's that, that part of it was useful, but it very quickly became a very um, dangerous way of looking at this because um, what this whole ethics for AI narrative became was that the law of the land does not apply to AI, um, which is in to, to you know be really, really clear legally, it's bullshit, right? Like it is a completely baseless claim. Our laws on the whole are technology neutral, which means they apply to all technologies and none. So we, we came to uh, describe this as ethics washing, this idea that you're playing you're paying lip service to the idea of um, you know AI can cause harm as well as help, uh, but it was just a discourse that, that didn't lead anywhere. And and really um, the, the core idea behind this was that companies should choose what um, rules they should follow and what rules they should not follow, which is not how it works in a democracy. It's, it's how things work in a Hobbesian hellscape. Um, so then over the last 12 months or so, there was another massive shift. Um, so the guy that you can see on the picture on the screen is a guy called Sam Altman, perhaps the most influential person in the world at the moment when it comes to uh, generative AI and maybe AI more broadly. He's the CEO of OpenAI, um, the company behind ChatGPT. And what he said just over a year ago in Congress was AI regulation is essential. You think a decade ago they were saying all regulation is bad for AI. Now AI regulation is essential. So in principle, I agree with him. In theory, I agree with him. The difficulty is a lot of these people, are, sorry, Siri seems to have is this, anyway. um, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, tech leaders are very difficult to pin down when it comes to going beyond the principle, the theory of yes, we need regulation in this space. But as soon as uh, a specific law is proposed, well, not that law, right? Um, there's an entire Yes Minister episode devoted to this idea. It was actually not about AI, obviously, because Yes Minister was 45 years ago. Um, but the, but the, some of you may remember, it was about um, employing women in senior roles. And you see this cabinet table of men 
and each of them responsible for a different um, government department. And they all agree, in principle, we should employ more women in senior roles. And each of them had a reason why it should not be their department that employs women in senior roles. And on its face, each of those arguments was, you know, it wasn't stupid. And it's the same here. But if the net effect of AI regulation is essential is that we just talk about how essential AI regulation is, then we are no further advanced than we are now. Um, and that's that's what worries me. Understanding the framework, if you're going to build legislation or what we call framework of it, you've got to have the foundations where people can understand the terminologies. Yeah. Because um, administrative law, I'm a lay person. I'm reading the books, I don't understand the Wally words. Yeah. So when it comes to definitions for AI, you've got to understand the terminologies of how it interrelates and how it's built. Because unless you know how it's built and the terminologies are laid down, you don't know how the hell there's AI discrimination. Yeah. Well, better yet, what you can do is you can say to a company, we don't care how you make a decision. You can say to a bank, we don't care how you make a decision. You, you, you can decide whether someone gets a home loan on the basis of an abacus, you know, a millennia old technology, or you can use the most sophisticated form of deep neural net AI. It's up to you. But your outcomes cannot be discriminatory against someone on the basis of their race or their age or their gender or whatever it happens to be. And then the, the onus is on the company, right? to make sure that whatever technology it uses, the outcome has to conform to our human rights law. And that, that is, I think, the much better way of regulating um, for the development and use of, of AI. So I mentioned, and this is slightly naughty of me, um, I've just got a book, it's my first ever book. I'm hoping it's my last ever book because it almost killed me. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, so it is entirely about AI and human rights. So if you happen to be interested in this stuff, um, you can uh, you can order it online. Um, there's a, a discount code. You can get 20% off um, if you before the end of the month if you type in SYD20, SID20. Um, so that's everything that I wanted to say um, for now. Um, those are my contact details, but I'll, I'll leave. I quite like quite like the image on the front of the the book. That's um, uh, Renee Marguerite who did that that okay. um, that painting. Um, very interested in, in hearing some questions. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll yeah. some questions. Well, yeah, do you want to do you want to be in charge of questions? The, the, the bad news. Uh, thank you, thank you, Bruce. That, that, that was just wonderfully specific. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, yeah. Mm. You have a question, Eugene. I do, and it's because my AI brain doesn't work well, I write things down. It's called paper and pen. <laughs> Still works for me. I'm here. When will AI generate common sense? Though? You said it doesn't happen. I'm not worried about sentience. I don't think they'll ever get sentient. The common sense must be able to reprogram. No. No, it will never. no, it won't. And, 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 and the reason no, is... Ever. No, because... Yeah. Well... I'm not sure we'll ever get to AGI, certainly not on the path that we're on now. Mm. So the, 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 let, me, let me explain to you what I mean by that. I, I'm not a futurist, by the way, so I'm, I'm, I'm not good at predicting the future. But what I would say is that, that... Not really. But the, what I would say is if you, if you are living in a world of correlations, and that's what machine learning is, you're, you're finding patterns in data, you get some amazing insights, but for every amazing insight you get, you get a lot of white noise. So let's go back to the criminal justice data set. If you ask for some correlations from the criminal justice data set, you'll get all kinds of stuff like, you know, the vast majority of people who commit murder in Australia have a shoe size of 10 and above, which is true, right? That's true. But it's unhelpful, right? It's, yeah. It would be much more helpful to say that the vast majority of people who commit murder in Australia are men and generally quite strong, big men, right? Like that's that's an insight. The, the, the shoe size thing can send you off on a path. It's not that it's wrong, but it sends you off on a path that, that can be the opposite of an insight. It can, can, can lead to um, confusion and, and all kinds of things that are not helpful, right? A world of correlations, which is the world that, that machine learning offers us, offers us both insight and confusion. And it doesn't matter. You can keep on throwing more and more training data. Like ChatGPT is trained on as close to an in, 
entire photograph of the internet at a particular moment in time, right? It is an unimaginably vast data set, which is why we're chewing up so much energy with generative AI. And yet it still hallucinates. It still spouts both insightful stuff and crap, right? And why? Because it hallucinates. That's the that's the sort of technical yeah, term. Yeah, it makes it makes stuff. Term, yeah. yeah, it makes stuff up. The, 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 I, I won't bore you with all the technical reasons, but but the way that um, generative AI, that incredibly sophisticated AI, works is that it it learns patterns from words, right? So a word like red, we know we categorize that in our mind. We know red is a color, and it's like other colors, like green, and blue, so on, right? So we know we know that we, we ascribe some meaning to the word red. That's not how generative AI or other forms of AI work at all. Instead, what it does is that it notices that red is often used in a similar context to green, to blue, that kind of thing, right? So it will learn from those patterns something about red, but it doesn't, it doesn't get any insight. It just tries to then predict the next word in a pattern, right? And that's how it generates text. That's how it generates hundreds of thousands of words, right? That is not the way in which we think. That is fundamentally different from the way in which we think. And so if what you are doing is trying to imbue a machine with common sense, you would need something at least in addition to that. Um, patterns are not enough. Patterns give you so many amazing things. So I'm not saying that correlation is unimportant. I'm not saying that correlation can't get you to extraordinary insights, but it will also get you to bullshit. And then there's actually a technical, I mean that, so there's Emily Bender, if you're interested in bullshit and AI, Emily Bender has written whole books on it. Hey, hold on, is there somebody who wants to ask a question who's not a member of the council? Oh. Uh, well, <laughs> you know you can. You've been a member of the council. Anyway, sorry, unfortunately, one of you. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ed, thanks very much for your presentation. Fantastic. Um, I'm just interested in the way you spoke about regulation. Um, say, the Commonwealth Bank, I think in Australia is trust us, we've got, um, we're using the technology, but it's not discriminating. How does the regulator um, go behind that and say to them, show it, you know, prove it, that yeah. you're not discriminating because you know, you've had complaints or or most challenging problems in this area. Um, I think in all the work that I've done on human rights, one of the most dispiriting situations to find oneself in is the unsettling feeling, you know, maybe I was denied a home loan because of my gender. And the way that human rights law is meant to work, and discrimination law being an example, is that you can take that unsettling feeling and you can scratch at the surface and determine, right? So um, we know that if you had a human bank manager that made that decision, that he, it's almost always a he, right, in this situation, would be smart enough to know that even if he was sexist, he would know that he couldn't say, I denied the home loan because I think women make bad customers. He wouldn't say that, right? He instead would have some other rationale that he would seek to advance, but over, a very long time, we've developed ways that are imperfect, but that are pretty good at being able to get to the true rationale for a human decision, right? So that, that, that's our legal system prior to the rise of AI. But if you have a black box decision-making system, and many AI systems are black box decision-making systems, in other words, they spit out an answer, but they don't give you the rationale for that answer, then, then you find yourself in a very, very difficult position because essentially what the bank in that example would be saying is, no, trust us, it's a very clever machine, right? We have told it not to discriminate, but 
unfortunately, there are all too many examples where precisely that happened. It was told not to discriminate, but it creeps in. The most famous example of this, which I'm sure many of you would be aware of, is called Compass from the United States. So this was not a banking example, it was a tragic actually example from the criminal justice system in the United States. And it involved, um, it, was a, it was a system that was used for bail decisions as well as um, for sentencing decisions. But just to make it simple, I'll just make it about sentencing. So judges in, the, in a bunch of US states kind of said, well, look, I get someone, they're convicted, do I give them a five-year sentence or a six-year sentence? I don't know. Like this is, this isn't science, but it makes a huge difference for the, for the human, you know, the, the the person who's been convicted. I want something that will make it easier for me to make a rigorous decision. So they developed this this algorithm called Compass. They said train it on previous decisions so that you can have consistency and like cases are treated alike and all relevant factors are taken into account. All relevant factors taken into account. All relevant. So they let it take into account whatever factors it was. And they said, you cannot take into account the individual's race. Cannot, cannot, cannot. An amazing journalist, Julia Angwin, who was um, working for ProPublica at the time, incredible investigative journalism outfit, she, what she was able to show was that if you were African-American, your sentence on average would be double the length of a non-African-American person where all other relevant factors were the same, right? So same um, offence type, same or, or, or similar enough um, other uh, relevant um, uh, characteristics. So why on earth was that happening? Um, so it took an incredible amount of work, but what they were able to show, and there's a technical term for this, that there are a whole bunch of proxy variables that are very similar to um, race. Now, what does that mean? It's actually very simple. In Australia, we would say postcode. In the United States, they would say zip code. So in many parts of the United States, your zip code, where you live, correlates really, really closely to your race because it's a very divided country in, in lots of parts of the United States. So if you were living in a particular suburb of the United States, 90% African-American. So they were not taking into account race, but they were taking into account zip code, right? So what ended up happening was that um, people from a particular zip code were getting higher sentences on average because that's what had been happening historically. So to be able to get that information is incredibly difficult. You need technical, deep technical expertise, and you need to be able to crack open the black box of, of AI to actually find out how it's making those decisions. And that is really, really difficult. So some of the deepest work that we're doing at the moment is with a whole bunch of Australian regulators to try and address that problem. Frankly, I am less worried about getting the rules right because a lot of our rules are technology neutral, they apply to all technologies and none, right? What I am more worried about is the courts and the regulators' ability to enforce the rules because that's really hard. Good you, Gene. Well, the other was strictly on the council. Um, I'd like to be a stack of questions. You seem to have skewed around robo debt, which um, the, the, I'm sure everyone's aware of it, but it to be a suicide note. Yes. And uh, the post office case, which was um, probably more malicious because the, 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 the companies knew that they were um, brought in the system. But um, how do you see the way around it now? I mean, in many ways, you could have um, the algorithms work okay, but there's not really a human invention to, to balance things out. Like it's not enough to have a human in the loop. So that's the, the example from Ukraine shows actually it was still the 18-year-old the Ukrainian soldier making those decisions, but she or he had and was clinging a grim death to the fact that the technology was giving them an answer. So they were just deferring to the machine. The, one of the untold stories about RoboDebt was that Services Australia up until that point had never employed more people. They employed a whole bunch of people to quote unquote administer those decisions. The difficulty was that you may as well have employed a whole bunch of hamsters or chickens or something, right? Like they were not able to second guess the decision of the machine. And so they weren't able to pick up errors, right? So yes, you need human intervention, absolutely. But the human needs to be 
properly empowered to be able to improve the decision making process and to be able to identify where when it is going off course. They knew, they knew the federal government, there were, I think 20, correct me if I'm wrong, there were 20 AAP decisions and the federal government refused to appeal it because they were sure and then there was a decision. So the theory, yeah, no, no, look, I have nothing but negative things to say about probate, don't get me wrong. But the theory that the government was working on was that these were all isolated decisions. There's so much, I mean, so much of the robot debt story has nothing to do with technology and anything with politics. So one of the things that I don't think gets told enough from the Royal Commission was that the federal government started with this estimate of $400 million a year of how much, which was how much they would save um, via robo debt. They were so excited about that figure that before they even finished testing the tool, they took $400 million out of the budget for that year and $400 million out of the budget of the next three years, in other words, out of their full forward estimates. They took $1.6 billion out of um, what's now called Service Australia, Central, right? The problem with that was that when you had these things that are sometimes called weak signals, right? You had people like me, trying to take my clothes off and get attention very unsuccessfully, I hasten to say, um, when, when I was Human Rights Commissioner. You had the Ombudsman, you had a whole bunch of AAT decisions, you had a whole bunch of people like Asher Wolf and, and others from civil society going, there's a terrible problem here. There couldn't be a terrible problem from the perspective of government because there was no money. If that, that, if that reality was true, then there was a much bigger problem, right? Because they couldn't turn off the system because the money had already been taken out of the system. And so I mean, this is this perverse thing that you see Michael would be aware of from um, test case litigation, right? That until a problem gets so, so big that a department or an agency couldn't possibly deal with it in their budget, they often won't do anything about it. Because when it gets that big, that it's no longer the department's problem, you go directly to Treasury. That money came, comes out of um, consolidated revenue. So the $1.7 billion that ended up having to be paid out so far to Australians who, the 430,000 plus Australians who were caught up in RoboDebt, that didn't come from Services Australia. That came from consolidated revenue. It was too much money. And so there's this perverse incentive to go way bigger, allow the problem to get way, way bigger. But as I say, that's got nothing to do with technology and everything to do with politics. I mean, it seems to me that people caught RoboDebt, but it's basically a, a, a primary school maths thing where Somebody decided that you would take their annual income and divide it by 26 and then compare it with what they got every fortnight, which was always stupid. It was bullshit. Yes, yes, but it's not, it's not an AI problem, is all I'm trying to say. Anyway, sorry. Do you have any questions online? Because they keep up again and got that and aren't people asking questions online? No. Okay, well, somebody else had a question over here. A great general question. Okay. Just this one with AI. What concerns me is that. Is there a system where you have an AI to be more sophisticated, where you have another AI system to check on that AI? It may well be this thing that's stupid, but you might want to look at something and have another AI. Oh, that, that does happen. That, that's quite a frequent way of... They talk about red team, right? Which yeah. is, can mean all kinds of different things in different contexts. Like actually Google something, you need to want to check another Yeah, yeah. So it's, another term for it is adversarial. It's basically you, you check, right? We're, that's a perfectly legitimate way of doing it. But you still need a source of truth. So AI1 says the answer is black, AI2 says the answer is white. Which one do you believe, <laughs> right? Like you've, you've still got to. Um, yeah. Um, probably one other question. I don't know if there is another one. Yeah, there's another one. Yeah, Uh, interesting. And I guess my question is about like in Britain, there's more people obviously be involved in trying to move things along a little bit. Um, I think the conclusion that you're um, requesting, which is that we need to make the results or the, you know, what they do, what they end up doing, being the place where we hold them to account, is very, um, is very uh, persuasive. But 
could have as a way of you know, saving and, and making those kind of decisions. And the other, the other side of it is that the last time you could utilize it very much in war, and you know, you use the aeroplane analogy, and what really shocked me was to really think about the fact that when you headed the plane, you were in what's now 1996 or something, we were using it in war. In, and it didn't take very long before we had took that technology and used it to murder people. Um, so yeah, there's a few things back in there, but just how much how appetite you think is a subject which you know, it does sound like the way through it. Um, in terms of trying to hold them to account. And then uh in the next year or two. I mean the, the federal government is um, consulting at the moment on um, tightening the law. Um, I think that's a good idea. Is that back on the truck to you? Um, they're not hearing that much from the community. It's really important, I think, to yeah. to write into your MP and to Minister Husick, who's the Minister Primary Responsibility, but the Treasurer also has a lot of responsibility in this area. Prime Minister, they need to hear that people care about this yeah. stuff because. I think what's implicit in your question is if we don't get this stuff right now, it'll gallop away from us. Um, and it, you know, it requires good lawyers and others to to hold the line. It's 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 that sort of getting my grammar right. You know, it's the law, at least in theory, applies to AI now. But if you're not applying the law rigorously, it may as well not. Like Father Frank Brennan said at the start of his report back in 2009 on human rights in Australia, he said, you know, a, a rule that isn't enforced isn't a rule at all. It's just a good idea. And we can't allow that to happen when it comes to, to AI. Um, so yeah, we need two things. We need stronger rules. We need better enforcement. Um, all right. Sorry, is that, do you think that that yeah, I think it's a few things. I think it's that I think there's a very low degree of trust in the Australian community when it comes to AI. Um, people have seen things go wrong, or I bet it's a good example. Um, and so I think there is a moment. Yeah, yeah. I think you've had a few comments. So, no, so I like technology. I've, I've been researching the AI technology that's used in the military. I'll just say Google Lambda. That's a AI military targeting program that's used in the Middle East where they use it as a algorithm for killing. In other words, they target data sets that are uh, drawn into it and it's um, signed up by a person under 10 seconds for uh, kill, not kill. In other words, um, so AI has now been weaponized. Um, and, and the rate of weaponization, decisions are made in the war zone in the Middle East, who's going to live and die on AI data sets. So now it's the evidence now. So big data is utilized. So yeah, that and that. There's other technical terms I can give on the different AI targeting packages out there, but it'll scare people when they start Googling the terms yeah. to know what, what they are. All right, well, that's, that's it's a scary. Scary way to end. Yeah. Okay. Catherine and Julie, I mean, because of the hour, I think we can address most of the questions and we're moving on. Thank you. Oh, they're there going to. Um... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> So thank you so much, Ed. Oh, We're you. grateful that you're able to make the trip to the engine to talk with us about this um, and for your illuminating, ominous and humorous introduction to some of the flaws in AI. Um, I think your words are really energising and highlight the importance of civil liberties advocacy and human rights advocacy going forward um, so we can hold politicians accountable. <laughs> 
had followed your work for a while, the um, Human Rights and Technology Report that the State Human Rights Commission put out in 2021 is something really fascinating with the other for digital rights. So uh, thank you for all your work in that area. Look, a little patient appreciation. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks very much. Thank for you. Yeah, thank you, Michael. for helping put these events on, and thank you to Steve Green and for making the live stream possible. Thank you. And I think the lead is the and thank you for the No, 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 no. It's 10 to 4. It's 10 to 10 to 4. Yes, good. Uh, uh, I really, really enjoyed everyone and I thank everyone who attended online this evening. Thank you very much for coming. The reason I'm speaking this evening is this. TCCL is 60 in four years' time. And like all little old ladies, they need money. <laughs> we do too. So, if you are interested in LGBT rights, if you are interested in Other people who want to buy raffle tickets, well, as Julia states, just said, we're happy to take your money. <laughs> so we'll, when people start to buy, finish buying the raffle tickets, we'll draw the raffle and I'll take my crunched up tickets uh, down there. <laughs> 